This is Kate Up with Max K. All right, three, two, one, and we're rolling. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Keyed Up, brought to you by Max Key and proudly sponsored by Stonewood Key. Today, I'm joined by a legend of a man, see me be, David Seymour. Good to see you, Max. Welcome to the pod, my friend. Hey, look, it's nice to be on here. You had some good people. I'll see if I can hold it up. Yeah, no, very excited to have you, have you on. We um, had a lot of requests for this, so... Well, let's make the most of it. Yeah, no, for sure. Last time I saw you, we were swinging golf clubs. Yeah, and I gotta say, you got some talent there. What are you playing off now? Uh, I'm off scratch, but like pretty dusty. Like yeah. I'd probably play like a three. Ha- or four. Hang on, how can you? You're off scratch. So you're off scratch, but dusty. Like, <laughs> I like because there's like you know like there's levels to it. Yeah. Um, like I'm not as consistent now. I don't have as much time, and um, yeah. but yeah, I I can still hit the ball really well. It's just like little yeah. short game. Things. Well, you saw me. I'm I'm more focused on just like contact with the ball. Like if if the club touches the ball that's 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 a win you're a real and then wherever the ball goes that's that that's a bit more that's a bit more variable it was so funny when that <laughs> photographer was standing there and you were like if you he's like unless you're a labor voter <laughs> he was he was used to dealing with like taking photos of professional golfers where <laughs> <laughs> no that was that was hilarious i um well i think you are a real showman though i mean I was concerned about you making contact with the ball for the first few holes, and then when the big crowd turns up, you bloody smoked one. Yeah, I know, but that, you know, this is something though. Like, and there's a, I think it's a big topic in in society at the moment is um, just statistics. So, mm. like, when something like that happens, you got to ask yourself, what's the probability of that happening randomly? And like, I, I do one shot every round that Tiger Woods would be proud of, but <laughs> I don't know when it's going to be. So that that was just randomness. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that was then so I, then I do like about 180 other shots. <laughs> <laughs> do you play much golf or was that just like a... No, nah, when I was a kid at um, like intermediate level, we actually lived a, a K from a golf course. So I'd get the bus home uh-huh. and then I'd actually walk down the middle of the road because it's in the country. Uh, walk down the middle of the road, play nine holes, and go home for tea. So it was a it was a good time, but um, I kind of learned how to do it badly because I never really had any coaching. Just like because it, it was literally, I think it was thirty six dollars a year to join the club wow. as a as a kid. Yeah. Um. So it was you know it was it shows what a great place New Zealand is. It was a paradise. So it was not a bad course. Um. So I basically got really good at playing badly. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So what what's your story? I mean, I obviously know a lot about your political career and. You know what you've been up to in more recent years, but what what was life like for little Simi B as a kid? Oh, look, I um, so I, so first of all, I was in Whangarei, and um, like a lot of people in the nineties, my parents got into a fad called lifestyle blocks, where you know the idea was that you'd live kind of close enough to drive into the city, but also have a bit of land, and we had a goat called Jasper. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like a lot of people, it's a great childhood, right? I mean, it's mostly safe. Um, you could have hobbies, you could make model boats, you know, the parents all had their friend network and they would have, you know, Friday drinks and kind of let all their kids run riot at a different house each Friday. Um, and, you know, went off to school and had some, some good teachers and some not so good teachers. Uh, so, you know, it was a, it was a good time. And, um, you know I, know, I know that I was lucky. And I had my grandparents had a place at the beach, so we'd go out there on weekends. Um, so, yeah, look, a Northland childhood wasn't too bad. What were you like at school? Um, well, I was kind of, I was one of those kids that was pretty, I was okay academically, um, but I was also a, a little bit out there and that I wasn't sort of someone that fell into line and went with the crowd and went with the flow. Um, and I think that's why I sort of developed a, a little bit of my um, verbal battling skill. Uh, yeah. Because... <laughs> Because basically, I was, um, you know, always always had something to say, um, and didn't always agree with going with the flow. So, in a way, I was sort of practicing what I do now. Well, obviously, I, I didn't realise it. I mean, I never thought I'd be a politician. I remember when um, Christian Cullen, sorry, Michael Cullen, was announced. He became the finance minister, and I heard this on the radio, and I thought they must be talking about Christian Cullen. Yeah. And then I realised they weren't, so I just did something else. And that was that was about as much as I cared about politics for you know the first half of my life anyway. What were your kind of dreams in as a kid? Like, because you studied engineering, didn't you? Oh yeah. Well, I'm like most people, right? Like you start off with like astronaut and then rock star, 
And then I think for a while I wanted to be Prime Minister. I mean, that's ironically the one that I'm sort of far from but closest to. Um, and, and the rock star thing, that was killed by actually getting a guitar. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so um, and then, then it's sort of, you know, ultimately I realised I like making stuff. You know, I made a car and, um, so, and my family had, was in business and, and in electrical businesses. So, um, you know, electrical engineering was kind of the obvious thing. And I was, you know, maths and physics were my better subjects. Not so good at English, still, don't, still not sure what that was about. Um, but um, did all that stuff and, and ended up saying, look, I'm going to, you know, be an engineer and make useful stuff. And also, I was like a lot of kids, and I think a lot of younger kids feel this now. And I think it's probably way worse than it was when I was at school. There's this anxiety that we are destroying the planet. And we've got to do something about it because otherwise, you know, the sea level's going to rise and the fire's going to come down and it's almost like a biblical sort of thing. We'll be lucky to have space between the floods and the fires to survive. I mean, that's, uh, I think kids are really being scared about that now. Mm. Um, we had a milder version of that and I felt like we had to do something that was going to um, somehow save stuff. But I also kind of wanted a Ferrari. Yeah. So, so I was like, and, and, and the other thing I had, sort of this, imagine this sort of trinity, like I, I also, and this probably tells you more about what sort of kid I was, so I was thinking about these sort of things. Um, I also didn't like the idea that, you know, maybe I'd get a Ferrari, but not everyone would. And, and so some people had to be rich and other people had to be poor. I thought, why can't everyone be rich? Um, I was like, well, that's because if everyone had a Ferrari, we'd definitely destroy the environment completely. And that, you know, as a kid, made me really anxious. I think a lot of kids are really anxious and depressed about these sorts of things now because they're constantly told, you know, apart from the fact you're responsible for things that happened 200 years ago done by people of the same skin colour, then that's all bad. They're also told the world's going to end, you know, because there's a climate crisis or emergency or whatever. And I resolved that anxiety for myself by asking myself, well, you know, how could everyone win? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I got into the kind of politics I, I, I got into was just a simple observation that actually, you know, creativity can get more out of less, that it's not a zero sum game. It's not like there's only so much wealth and it's not like there's only so many ways to solve our problems. And a classic example um, that, um, you know, some people like to use is you, you look at light. I mean, 200 years ago, you basically had to, you know, kill animals and use the fat to make candles. Now you've got LEDs. Mm. and it's gone from the average person having to work for a day to get one hour of light to literally having to work for one second to get light, yeah. um, an hour of light, that is. So you know, the, the world is just getting better and better through creativity and innovation. And what I sort of, having resolved that, because I was really worried about this as a kid, I thought we were going to run out of stuff and you know destroy the world and there wouldn't be enough and some people would be poor and it's all going to be terrible. I started asking, well, how, why is it that in some places people are really free and innovative and creative and they take a little bit and they make lots of happiness and prosperity out of it? And there's other places where um, basically people just hack each other to death with machetes. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that's the kind of kid I was. I was quite a serious kid. Yeah. Um, but thinking about those problems, that's, that's sort of... Uh, consumed most of my teens and 20s and, and, and got me, you know, wanting to do what I do now. It's interesting, though, that you're, you know, obviously actors on the further right wing kind of of the New Zealand spectrum. It's interesting that you kind of ended up there given you had such concerns about, you know, wealth diversity and poor and rich. And But I challenge that. I mean, if you think about euthanasia, say, yep. like that's something that is so mostly in Parliament, Labour and the Greens voted for it and, you know, the Nats didn't. So, you know, are we, are we right or left? Um, whereas once you start talking about tax, I mean, there's an old joke, right, that, um, you know, the, the Greens want to let you buy and sell marijuana, but they won't let you buy and sell anything else. Um, <laughs> whereas, you know, we're in favour of free enterprise, cannabis as well, actually, but, um, you, you know, we're in favour of free trade and free enterprise and business. Um, but once you start thinking about those principles... You know, why is it that you wouldn't think your mind and your body being free was just as important as your money and your property being free? Mm. And so once you start thinking about freedom, it kind of cuts across left and right. Yep. And and I guess the reason I came to it was, you know, it's, it's not that the left care more about poverty or the environment. They pretend to, and they're maybe they're better at pretending to. And maybe that's why they do well and better than us sometimes. Um, what really marks out the left is that they mostly want 
control over your economic resources. They want to centrally plan it. They want to stop you buying plastic bags and looking for oil and gas and driving cars with more than a one liter engine and any other naughty things you've been doing. Um, they're not about caring, they're about control. And we, we saw that through COVID. Mm. So, you know, I don't think it's surprising. I don't think it really is on the right, first of all. And second of all, I don't think it's surprising that, that someone would use freedom to solve problems that the left is good at pretending to care about. Okay, so I understand what you're saying, but say that I'm, I've am i grown up in a very poor family. You know, I live in South Auckland. My parents have both kind of struggled their whole lives, you know, and I sit there and I go, David Seymour's just, you know, a rich white guy that doesn't care about me. And you've got John Key and Christopher Luxon and all these guys, and they're just rich pigs that don't give a shit and Labour cares about me. What would you say to that? Well, I'd ask them to come and visit Rise Up Academy. You know, I'd ask them to come and visit uh, Pacific Advanced Senior School. You know, I'd ask them to come to South Auckland Middle School. I mean, we are the ones that enabled South Auckland communities, mainly Maori and Pacific people, to create schools that engage those communities on their terms. And it's not like we had to, you know, abandon our usual philosophy. This is a product of our philosophy. We said, look, freedom is good because mm. people in each community know more stuff than people in Wellington know about their community. So I would just say, look, that's a, you know, the, the, the actors had very little political opportunity in the last decade. We're basically in euthanasia and charter schools. Um, so at least half of the stuff we've done has been precisely to benefit and give opportunity to people in those communities. And pe people should visit those schools and, and come and talk to the people there about what X done. Mm. One question I did have coming into this, and I, I've actually thought about this a lot. So say, say someone like yourself where, you know, you're heavily passionate about politics, you know, whether people agree or disagree with your views, you know, you're trying to steer New Zealand in the way that you think, you know, is best for the country. You know, I don't think there's anyone in politics maybe bar one person I can think of that is in it for the fully wrong reasons. And, you know, so I guess, I guess, sorry, what my question was going to be is to say, you know, you're obviously trying to do everything you can to make New Zealand a better place. So why then would you go into a party where, like, you probably can't be the Prime Minister if you're head of ACT? Or do you disagree with that? Um, it's a really good question. And the answer is that, you know, positions are, are not that important. Yeah. So, like, I don't see it as being a, an achievement to be, um, you know, the Prime Minister of New Zealand or a minister. Uh, and the reason for that is that I, I lived in North America, and what I realised is that there are, like, you know, 10 Canadian provinces and 50 American states. It's like 60 countries that are, on average, about the same size as New Zealand. Mm. And, you know, you look at all those places, and they all have a government just like New Zealand's. And so I sort of traveled around. And I'm like, well, being one of those people is, is not that special. Um, but it is an opportunity to do good stuff. Um, and so, you, you know, my question is not can I get a position? My question is can I, can I win uh, better policies? Because that's what I think makes the difference. You know, there are, there are countries in the world that have everything. South Africa has everything, but their policy is terrible and the place is falling apart. There are countries that have nothing. I mean, Singapore has nothing. It's just a rock. Mm. Um, and yet it's like the what second or third wealthiest place on earth. Um, yeah. the, the other places have oil. So, you, you know, that, that, that shows that the policy choices matter. And I don't think you necessarily need the position. In fact, I think if you're focused on the position, you might forget about the policies. So, you know, for example, when I got asked by John Key, you know, you want to be a minister? And I was like, oh, well, it's 50 grand. You know, when you're 32 years old, a 50 grand pay rise is a lot of money. Um, I turned it down because as a minister, I couldn't do euthanasia. And, um, you know, getting that policy done turned out to be way more important than getting that position. Why couldn't you do euthanasia, sir? Oh, just because um, the way the rules of parliament work, um, members' bills are there for people who aren't in government. Mm -hmm. So if I became a minister, I wouldn't be able to do a members' bill. And if I, if I was a minister, the only way I could get euthanasia done is if the whole government agreed with it. And of course, we had people like Bill English who were never going to agree. So I had to do it privately, and that meant staying out of being a minister. One thing with euthanasia, so I got told, I think my dad told me this, he was saying that Obviously, it's, you know, a great thing to have, and he was all for it, you know, because it's good to have give people the choice. Well, he said he was going to vote for it, and then he left Parliament. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can assure you he, he did. But I appreciate he would have, yeah. Um, but what he said was interesting about it 
and this was what he got told was that it's a weird bill because I guess the premise of life is there's not many people that, you know, say right now if I got diagnosed with cancer today and they said, you're terminally ill, you got six months, I would never be like, turn me off now. Mm. You know, I would never choose for the euthanasia right now. And what basically what he, the way he described it to me, and this could be wrong, this is what I'm keen to pick your brain on. So he was saying that by the time that you're at a physical point where the better option is to be dead rather than alive, you're generally at a point where you're not coherent enough to be signing or agreeing to be euthanized. So he said that there's very few people that, like the premise of it's great where you go, I should have the right to choose whether or not I want to die. Hmm. But in action, is it actually effective? Because usually by the point where that is the better alternative, at that point, that person's not in a state to be agreeing to it. Mm. That's such an interesting point. I mean, first of all, you you actually make the decision and go through all the assessments and stuff, and and then you've got a six month window that you can you know choose a time and then you can delay it as many times as you like. Uh-huh. Um, so it, it's a really interesting argument. Um, but I just like the way the way that it works mechanically is that you you get to do most of the work and very rigorous you know back and forth about is this really what you want before then but it's still an interesting argument because yeah in theory you you, you know you you have to make the decision while you're not in such agonizing pain that that, that you you know couldn't make it um, and I guess the part of the answer to that is it, it's such a difficult thing but I think what's important is the law lets each person make it their own way mm-hmm. um, and the alternative is I mean Someone I knew, a, a parent of one of my friends growing up, um, recently did an awful thing. He had motor neuron disease. He went out to the garage and ended his life. Um, he could have gone on for a few more years, but he, he didn't have the choice. So I think, first of all, giving people the choice legally means that people will... Uh, the current law wouldn't have qualified someone with MND, so that's why he couldn't. But So I think, first of all, giving the choice allows people you know, more flexibility. Um, and the second thing, and actually may end up making people live longer, um, but the second thing is that I just think, you know, while that may logically be true, um, it, it's really up to each person to decide if they say, okay, I, I know that's going to happen, so I'm going to cut out a certain point in my life in order to um, make sure that, that, you know, I don't have to suffer through the end but when I'm unable to make my own decision anymore. And, and I think people should have that choice. Is that why you were so passionate about it? Yeah, I was. I, I think the idea that we, that there's a tiny percentage of people, it'll only ever be somewhere between 1% and 5%, probably more at the lower end of that. Um, and I think it's a shame. Those people have really bad luck. And I don't think it's humane for us to effectively say to them, tough shit, you've got to suffer. I, I think if I was in that situation, I want the choice. And I probably almost certainly won't be statistically. Um, Do you mean but, getting some illness where? Yeah, I mean, you know, you hope you live to a hundred, die in your sleep, and um, and that's it. Um, but but if you're unfortunate, and it and it could happen to either of us, um, then in, in that case, I, I think you should have some choice. Mm. You know. No, I agree with that. So obviously, when you got the um, the euthanasia bill passed, that was wasn't that the same time with the marijuana? It was that's the same. Right. Yeah. What's it called again? Is it a Sort of sense. Um, referendum. Referendum. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Sorry. Yeah. And so, what what were your thoughts kind of on the marijuana? I voted yes, um, and for just for the simple reason that um, this country's got to do one thing: it's got to be to to get on top of P. Yeah. And um, I think probably the most dangerous con- conversation that happens in New Zealand, and I'm sure it's probably already you know it's what three o'clock. It's probably already happened a lot number of times today, and it'll happen many more times tonight. People go along to their weed dealer and say, um, you know, you've just uh, got any weed? And they say, oh, sorry, we're out, but do you want to try pee? You only need to try it once. Um, so anything we can do to get the cannabis market and the pee market separate is helpful. If people can go to a legal store and buy a tinny, then, you know, knock themselves out. They're doing it in Canada. It's not, it hasn't changed the world. It's not the end of Canada as far as we can tell. Um, so... You know that's that's the first thing, and the second thing, I just I just think we're here for a short period of time, 
and we don't really know much about where we came from or where we go. I mean, people have various theories and beliefs and spirituality, and I respect all of that. But the truth is most of us don't really know. Um, and I think we should just stop moralizing and try and impose on people. If, if they're not harming you, what's actually your problem? And by and large, people smoking cannabis doesn't actually harm other people. And if it does actually cost money, then there's a simple answer to that. Put a tax on it until the revenue equals the cost and let them make their choices. Yeah. So what would you say then to the people that go, well, why aren't all drugs legal? Because you hear that argument. You know, some people say that ecstasy and all these other drugs, if you made it legal and you, um, you know, were careful about the production and... Well, I mean, let's go through that and ask, well, what's the, what's the harm to other people? So the, thing, the reason P is different is that people who take P do actually go and commit really grotesque crimes. Um, and they do actually put a lot of costs on other people. They, they take P while pregnant. I mean, there's, there's kids now in this country are totally destroyed by that. So, you know, these are, these are issues that I think that there's harm to other people and it's, it's worth going to war on. Um, but you look at something like, say, MDMA, I mean, people are taking that all over the show, and as far as I can tell, it's not doing much harm. People just basically hug each other, which is kind of annoying, but, you know, um, you know, it's not a big problem. And, and so maybe that one's at the other end of the spectrum. But what I do know is that having half the New Zealand police force chasing people around trying to find drugs... Um, is probably not the best use of their time. And I don't, I think, I understand people say, oh, but drugs are bad and people shouldn't take them. Well, sure, but drugs are bad, drugs are banned, and people are taking them. So what's your next move? And I think that's probably going to be enlightened to start asking on a case by case basis how much harm is it worth it? Are we getting the best deal here? And in many cases, we probably won't be. Do you not think, obviously, you know, it's easy to say that ecstasy, people just run around hugging each other, but. Do you not think like the long term impacts on people's serotonin and you know the kind of the suicides that come with it and all those different things? Do you not think that that is a pretty big cost to society? Well, I thought you might know more about it than me, <laughs> and I was right. Um, again, I, I was saying on a case by case basis, maybe you need to look through you know what are the true effects, and I stand to be corrected on on MDMA. It's not something I know much about, to be perfectly honest. I've never taken it, but. Um, you, you know, I, nevertheless, I, I think that's how you do the evaluation, and, and you might decide that it is that bad. Um, on the other hand, you know, at some point, if people aren't harming others, mm. um, then I think it's worth asking the question, you know, is it right for me to moralise how you should live? If you want to have a great time, then have less serotonin, then, I don't know, it doesn't sound right to me, but yeah. is it my job to, to push that moral on you? And I, I think we need more debates like that in New Zealand. So what do you think of the government then, say, through COVID and, you know, as my dad called it, the hermit kingdom? You know, what were your thoughts on? Because a lot of people sit there and think that the government did an amazing job. Well, I think, first of all, you know, you've got to ask, what, what were the starting point? The starting point was an island nation of people who, aside from a small part of Auckland, people mostly live really far apart from each other by world standards, it's like basically uninhabited country. Um, and um, also a, a country of people who generally do the right thing, like New Zealand is a, you know, some of the most decent people around. There's no, there's almost no corruption. There's no nastiness. There's no people who are just basically shitheads. Like there are, in, I mean, there are, but not like other countries. So it wasn't, it wasn't too difficult. Um, against, so in a way we were always gonna do well and actually most island nations did. Next question, um, how did they perform? What did they have to do? Well, they had to test, useless. Uh, they had to trace, absolutely ineffective. They had to order the vaccine and roll it out, hopeless. And perhaps most important, they had to make logical rules of the game that didn't, that protected against COVID, stopped the hospitals getting swamped. Oh, and they needed to upgrade the number of hospital beds, which they were, we actually went backwards over the pandemic. There were fewer ICU beds at the end than the start. But So they failed at all that stuff. But perhaps the most important thing they had to do was make rules of the game that would minimise COVID at least cost to other things people were trying to do. Um, and they made a lot of stuff that was totally illogical. Like, there's quite a long period there, I think it was late 2021, where if you had COVID, you could go and isolate at home because there were too many people to put an MIQ. Um, 
On the other hand, if you came from another country and you took a negative test and almost, you know, there could be a false negative, but almost certainly didn't have COVID, then you had to go into MIQ. And if you couldn't get a MIQ spot, you were locked out of your own country. And, you know, you had the case of Charlotte Ballas, the pregnant journalist who was sheltering with the Taliban. I mean, this kind of insanity happened. Mm. Um, at one point, the Prime Minister of New Zealand said, you can visit your friend and sit in their garden, but you can't go inside to use the toilet. I mean, this all happened. This is insane. Um, then there was the stuff around the vaccination. All they had to do was say, look, we, we need to get vaccination rates to you know, over 90 because then the hospitals won't get swamped. And they could have said, look, you know, if, you get, if you do it, we'll give you a $250 tax break to recognise your savings to the healthcare system because it reduces your chance of showing up in hospital and that's what any rational insurance company would do. And when it comes to healthcare, the government is basically running an insurance scheme. You, know, you pay your taxes in. If you get sick, they give you healthcare. Um, and then they had to say, look, you know, if vaccinated and unvaccinated people have a conflict, here's how you resolve it. You have a vote in your, off, in your workplace or whatever. Um, that's all they needed to do. Instead, they went on this absolute power mad psychopathic power trip. And, you know, you saw what happened. We ended up with fires on the, you know, New Zealand looked like, you know, Moscow or some third world country with people setting the parliamentary lawns on fire. Um, when it came to making sensible rules of the game, all of their rules sucked. All of their testing, tracing and vaccinating sucked. Um, the only thing they had going for them was a really compliant, decent population, um, about 2,000 kilometres of ocean in every direction, and low population density. So they're, they're, they're a disaster. I mean, they deserve to be voted out for that alone. Would you have mandated vaccines? No, I would have recognised that, um, you know, first of all, there's a conflict between people, not between government. That They created the conflict between government and people. But there was a conflict between people. And I, I'll give you an example. Um, Imagine a hairdresser. She's been hammered for two years. She's got five uh, staff in her salon. Uh, she's, got, uh, she's in a wealthy Auckland suburb. 95% of people are vaccinated. And she's got two staff that don't care but are vaccinated, two staff that are vaccinated and militantly like, I did my bit, you should do yours, you know, why can't you? And one person that says, if I have to get vaccinated, that's the end of my human rights. Now, there, there needed to be a way to resolve that conflict. And we would have said, look, First of all, have you considered vax or test? If you've been tested at some point in the last 72 hours, you probably don't have it, and you're just as safe as someone who was vaccinated six months ago. But second of all, if you have to, then a workplace or a school or, or whatever, a midwife practice, they, they can make their own rules. And some people won't be happy with that, but at least you've got a process. Mm. That, that's different from what Jacinda said, like, if you don't get vaccinated, we'll basically ostracise you from society. So... You know, I think the government could have done better at offering it. They could have even given people tax breaks for doing it. Um, they could have you know, set out guidelines for companies to make their own policy, but they didn't have to do what they did. That was madness. Do you think not allowing New Zealanders to come home is a breach of like our human right as a Kiwi? Not human right, but... Well, I mean, you have a right to, you know, the Bill of Rights, you have a right to enter the country and come and go freely from New Zealand. So I, I think it is. Now, of course... The Bill of Rights has an out clause that you can breach the Bill of Rights, or the government can, to the extent that it's justified in a free and democratic society. Now, the courts so far haven't said that, they've said in specific cases it was a you know, breach of the Bill of Rights, but, but so far they seem to have upheld that the government heads the right to close the border and do something like MIQ. I think that's nuts. I, I think that they haven't properly weighed up the costs and benefits. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think one thing that we all need to think about is having a, a really sensible understanding of why basically every country, every government, different cultures, different political systems, you know, communist China, you know, democratic UK, whatever, they all just lost their mind mm. for like two years. Everyone went insane. And what I found was like when we just suggested, because we put out four policy papers saying, you know, maybe we just need to roll this back a bit. But, you know, we saw polling where, you know, I think at one point Jacinda Ardern had 87% support for her actions on COVID. So when we would suggest something like maybe instead of MIQ, you should be able to isolate in an Airbnb. 
people are like, oh my God, you want people to die. How many, I don't remember getting interviewed by Jack Tavis, like, how many deaths, David? How many people do you want to die? And I was like, fuck, I don't want anyone to die. I'm just saying there's, you know, there's trade-offs here and I'm not sure that we can afford to be sealed off from the world forever. And there's other things like kids need to go back to school. Um, you, you know, that, that kind of thing, I think so you can say that now, and it sounds rational. But at the time, it's 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 easy to forget how crazy the environment was, mm. and I think we all need to ask ourselves how that happened. I think the best, um, you, you know, uh, analysis is a book nudged into lockdown by a Auckland Uni professor, a behavioural economist, who talks about why people sometimes make irrational decisions for you know good scientific reasons, um, but. You know, there's also a lot of people who are looking at really crazy theories like it, it all happened because the secret people who secretly run the world made it happen. And that's just insane because, believe me, I, I know Jacinda. She couldn't she, she couldn't keep up with the global conspiracy. Even if she was in one, she'd screw it up. Um, so you don't worry about that, folks. She's not going to do a conspiracy. She's too dumb. Um, but sadly, she can't organize anything else. Um, but, you, you know, I, I think that the, 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 the sensible people need to ask why the world collectively lost its mind for two years and and made decisions and violations of rights and sacrifices that we'd never make to save as many lives as we save normally. One thing you talked about at the start of this podcast was you sat there and said that as a kid, you know, there was this anxiety that, you know, there was the belief that, you know, the global warming was happening and we're all going to die in this biblical thing. What's your thoughts then now on the fear mongering that went on because even myself so I I you know I obviously I was actually if I'm being honest I got like quite scared of COVID you know when we went into that first lockdown and you know we've got everyone like debt holing food and you know like, tastes terrible doesn't it oh like, horrific yeah. yeah had good breath though but <laughs> 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 but you know obviously through that time I was scared and I remember I went on my first trip when we got out of um you know, everything kind of opened up last April. And I went up to the States um, with my family. I was catching up with some friends there and I was like, oh, have you guys like had COVID? And they're like, yeah, like four times. And <laughs> they were like looking at me like I had some weird disease because I, I kept bringing it up and that's all I talked about. And they were like, dude, like shut up. Like no one cares. Like they'd gone to Vegas two weeks before knowing they would get COVID, but there was some gig on. Whereas in New Zealand, it was like I was genuinely like paranoid when dad would go to the supermarket and he came back in the house you know so if I was going through that anxiety I'm sure there were a lot of people that went through it and as you said in hindsight we can sit there now and you know obviously people died and it's obviously you know a terrible virus there's no taking away from that but the fear that went on and the paranoia and the like mental issues that have occurred from it what's your thoughts on all that? Well, I think a couple of things. One is that um, you know there was a real leadership failure by Jacinda Ardern. A real leader would have said, okay, there's things coming. We don't really know. We need to get more information. You know, We're going to close the border and, and potentially we're even going to lock down for a while until we get more information. But by the middle of 2020, it was quite clear that to people of most ages, it was – almost zero threat. To someone of your age, someone as healthy as you, I've seen your Instagram, you, you know, no threat. Um, to people who um, are older, then, then they, they really need to be careful. And one of the unsung heroes of our COVID um, response, that, that haven't got enough credit, was actually the, the retirement villages, the, the old folks' homes. Um, I remember back in February, so, so that year of 2020, I, I was actually scheduled to go and, and speak at their annual conference on my birthday in Fiji. So I was like, this is pretty awesome. And in February, because my birthday's in June, in February they um, they said, oh, sorry, we've canceled it. Yeah. And I thought, you absolute lunatics. It's like the one perk I've got in my whole political career. I was really looking forward to it. This thing will be over by April. But actually, they were way ahead of the game and they were way more rational. So, you know, those people needed to be protected. And one of the reasons New Zealand did well is that um, the retirement villages, mostly private businesses, actually did a good job of protecting older people. And a lot of the early deaths in the first few months just about all happened in a couple of retirement village outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So that's what made the difference. That's a side's point. Your question was about, you know, should people be scared? 
But I, I, I largely blame it on the failure of leadership. I mean, what Jacinda needed to say is, look, you know, we need to get more information. By the time we got to the middle of 2020, it was clear that it was not a major danger, that the, the, fa the case fatality rates, or more, more importantly, the infection fatality rates, were, were much lower than, than anyone had first thought. I mean, I thought it might kill 100,000 people in February, March, but, uh, or by March anyway, but, but it turned out that you know, it was never going to be anything like that. And instead of saying, OK, guys, we've dealt with this, um, we know the risks now, here's how we, we think we can go forward. She just continued with this crisis management mentality with the one o'clock press conferences and whipping everyone up into hysteria. Um, that was not real leadership. Uh, that was actually putting her own political agenda ahead and perhaps her enjoyment of that kind of crisis management that she had tasted before in other crises, putting that ahead of the best interests of the country. So that's, that's the, the, the main issue. I think the second thing is what you rightly allude to is what about the effects on mental health and kids going to school and what about the fact there's a whole lot of kids that have gone way off the rails now ram raiding everything they can find. Well, you know, a lot of that's happened um, because the government that talked about well-being, they said, no, it's not just going to be all about GDP and the economy anymore. It's about well-being now. Well, actually, as soon as COVID came along, they were back to focusing on just one thing and bugger every other aspect of humanity. Uh, and that's a real failing. Were you sh what were your thoughts on her resignation then? Oh, I've... Here, let me put this... The other great the, the thing, I, I, I've never had any malice towards her. I mean, I think she was way out of her depth. I think she didn't want to be prime minister. I don't think she should have been prime minister. I don't think she, frankly, was clever enough to be prime minister. She just... I remember, I remember, and I'm not saying this to be mean. I mean, I've known her and debated her so many times over the last 12 years. Um, and um, I just don't think that she was up to it. Um, however, I've never thought that she was a malicious person. A lot of people on the right are like, yes, she is. She's evil. I'm like, no, I don't think I know her better than most people on the right. And I, I don't think she is. Um, I, I just, I also think like, I mean, you know, when your dad resigned, people are like, oh, he's having an affair with Hickey Prada. I'm like, no one would have an affair with Hickey Prada. <laughs> you know, like, um, you, you just got to take people at their word. She, her kid's starting school this year, and she wants to be there on her kid's first day of school, and good on her. You know, I, I, I think it, it, it all makes perfect sense. What are your thoughts on Chris Hipkins? Um, it, it's, it's quite amazing that because they talk about this concept of failing upwards where you just what did Churchill say of success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no lack of loss of enthusiasm and this guy I mean man if you ever like if you if he retires and like asked to like be a director on your business or something just say no because he, he could make you broke in no time um, this guy I mean you think about it he's been in charge of education for five years uh, the teaching professions on strike, they're undervalued, they're pissed off. <laughs> you know, 100,000 kids running around regularly not attending school, um, you know, our, 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 our achievement in world league tables. You know, in fairness, he didn't have enough time to reverse it, but but certainly hasn't stopped going down. Um, it's difficult to think of anything good about education in the last five years. He's responsible for that. The public service has ballooned from 47,000 to 61,000. There's almost, I can't think of a single area of the public service where the customers, the taxpayer, are getting better value for money now. So he's mm. got all these extra people, but they're not delivering more results. Um, so public service is a disaster. In education, he was responsible for merging the politics into Te Pukenga. This is the organization that just issued a style guide banning person, people from saying the word students, <laughs> or they're also not allowed to say Treaty of Waitangi, they have to say Te Riti. Um, it's just nuts. Um, you know, but he was responsible for that. He's responsible for the COVID response, which we just covered. Uh, and he was the Minister of Police, where he had $6 million to hand out Falcon and Sidere. It's not a particularly difficult task. And, uh, you know, after six months and $6 million, they'd managed to install a total of seven. And this was, an ur this was their main policy response to an urgent problem. So th this guy is a walking disaster. I mean, you think of one thing, one portfolio, one responsibility he's had in government that he hasn't screwed up beyond all belief. But then what would you say to everyone? Because if I'm being honest, I've had a lot of people come up to me recently saying they think he's doing a really good job. And have they assessed his performance in any of his, his portfolios? But I think this is the problem is mm. 
I understand what you're saying, and I'm obviously in a similar echo chamber to you are. So, you know, a lot of the points you may talk about, you know, people around me might say, and, you know, I'm up to date with that. But I know firsthand when dad was in politics, most people don't actually give a shit about policy. Mm. But here's the problem. People do ultimately care about results. And so just to be clear, I'm not saying people are going to be like, oh, well, he screwed up that and that and that and that. I'm just giving you this background because Mm. I think he's going to keep screwing up and he'll make more screw ups. And here's the second thing. I don't think people will punish him because he, you know, leaked private information about Charlotte Bellis, the private journalist hiding with the Taliban, um, and then refused to apologize. What I do think is he'll make more screw ups and he'll get angry and he'll lash out and he'll do more stuff like that. And that that will be his undoing. And people will care about that. Because one thing I heard about him, and this was like a little inside scoop, was because he kind of comes across as chippy and, you know, he's like this nice little guy. But I got told by like an inside source that he's kind of the bulldog of the Labour Party. Is that true? Um, well, I think I think people, I think he personally, I think he's got a bit of a nasty streak. And, and I think it's only a matter of time before his frustration with his own performance um, means that he lashes out and people see that side of him. So I, I don't think you're far off. How would he lash out? Well, I mean, you look at the Charlotte Ballas case, a pretty clear one. You look at the two um, Northland women that, uh, you know, had the temerity to travel to Northland. In fact, they're actually Aucklanders. Um, he was quite happy to allow the rest of the world to think that they were prostitutes. He, he had lots of opportunities to correct that. Oh, so Because so I, I remember yeah. hearing or being told they were. Well, they weren't. They were, <laughs> I think they were Ministry of Social Development employees. Um, but my, my point is that, you know, he has a habit of being quite a tacky. Mm. and um, uh, it tends to involve members of the public. And, and I think that, you know, you'll see stuff like that and people won't like it. What's your view? This is the biggest thing I want to ask you coming from a minority, well, yeah, I guess like minority part of yourself. So what are your, th- I asked, I had dad on the podcast recently. It's going to be out after your one, but I asked him the same question. So I'm interested to hear your, your views. So there's a notion in MMP that the tail wags the dog. And so you get someone like a Winston Peters that becomes the kingmaker every election. What are your thoughts? So I asked him what he thought the moral ground of choosing the non-largest party, you know, because mm. you're effectively breaking like the unwritten constitution. But what are your thoughts, though, that someone like yourself or like a Win? I guess with you it's kind of more obvious that you would always go with the right. But what's your thoughts on someone like a Winston Peters being able to dictate who becomes prime minister? Well, I mean, first of all, he's he's yesterday's man, so you, you won't have that problem again because he, you know, acted in his own selfish way. Um, but I think, you know, it's really important if you look at any political contest, you've got to read the political rules. I mean, to be the Prime Minister, um, you've got to get um, the majority of Parliament to express confidence in you. I mean, that's that's actually what the rules say. So on any given day, can the Prime Minister get at least 61 votes in the House? If they can't, they may no longer be the Prime Minister. Um, so it may be true that, you know, New Zealand first were the last sort of people to join the party, so to speak. Um, and it may be that they could have gone the other way. But nevertheless, you know, I would put it back to you know, the obligation is on the person that wants to be the Prime Minister to, to build that majority. Mm. Um, that, that's their plan. And and the next thing I'd say is that ultimately the choice rests with the voters. So if a bunch of voters, I can't think, I think most of the people that voted for New Zealand first really re- regret that now, but um, if there's a bunch of voters who say, look, you know, the, the Act Party fits my values and I want to see my values expressed and therefore I'm going to give them my party vote, then you know that is that is how it works. The voters make that decision, um, and if someone wants to be prime minister, then they're going to look around who who the voters have sent to parliament and and figure out a majority. Who do you think is going to win the election this year? Um, I think Act and National will. I think the reason for that is simply that um, Labor have not run the government efficiently. They have tied up far too much resource and they haven't produced enough good stuff for New Zealanders, and we're all starting to feel poorer because <laughs> everyone has to be more efficient and economise except for them. Um, and then there's the fact that they're dividing New Zealand with the treaty and the fact that they are um, you know, making far too many rules and regulations that hold people back. So 
I think for those reasons, uh, people are going to be asking, well, who's actually got a bit of guts and a bit of brains and a coherent plan to, to start restoring the direction of New Zealand to values that actually make the place wealthier, actually make the boat go faster. So I, that, that's why I think we'll win. I was doing some research just on, just like a little bit of background on you before you came on, and I saw there were a few articles that were kind of referring to not to you kind of saying some like racist stuff. What would you kind of say to all that? Well, I'd, I'd challenge anyone to say what, what that is. Mm. I think we live in a really interesting time with race and, and politics. I mean, the way I look at it, racism is when you think that you know someone's race is, is more important than any other characteristic they have. Um, so, you, you know, I, I look at you, there's, there's lots of things about you. I mean, you, you know, you're a guy, you're straight, you're interested in building houses, you, you know, you're... Funny, you know, hilarious. You, well, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's so many aspects of you that we could, could think about. It's a pretty weird person that goes, but the most important thing about Max is that he's white. Mm. And yet a lot of policy now is actually racist in the sense that you go into healthcare, say, and the number one thing they're supposed to think about is what colour are you or what's your ethnic background. You look at the way the treaty's been dealt with, you know, your most important characteristic. We're not worried about anything else. It's, are you Maori? And I, I just think, you know, that fixation on race, I mean, that is the definition of racism, and I frequently criticise that. But the way other people look at it is they say, well, you know, because there are differences between different races, statistically, if you're not prepared to adopt our policy to fix it, that must be because you're racist. And there's, there's two problems with that. You know, one is that I might have better policies to solve the same problem, which we do. We've got charter schools, it's going to make it easier to build houses, it's going to make the economy grow faster, more opportunity, more social mobility comes out of that. You know, there's lots of, we actually got better answers. But the second point is that, you know, if you are a racist, then, of course, you focus on, you know, what someone's race is, and then, of course, any difference you find becomes your main focus. Yeah. If you're not a racist, if you're someone like me, you say, okay, well, there is a problem with healthcare, there is a problem with education, but I suspect one of the main problems is that if people move from one damp, mouldy house or motel to the next, A, they get respiratory illnesses, B, they don't establish a pattern of shopping at the supermarket and eating healthy food, and C, their kids are going to a different school every term. And we see this in, in, in the Epsom election. We've got schools where kids come in for like six weeks and they get moved to a different motel. I suspect that there is a problem with housing in New Zealand. That's mm -hmm. a really big problem. But you know what? It actually doesn't no matter what your ethnic background is. There may be more Maori people in that situation, but there's not only Maori people in that situation. So I'm interested in, in solving the real practical problems, um, whereas people who are, actually are racist, um, uh, you, you know, they say, well, you have to focus on race and only race. That's the primary characteristic of a person. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't do that, it must be because you don't care about race X or Y or Z. And I'm saying, no, 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 I don't do that because I don't want to characterize people like that in the first place. What would you say then to the people that, you know, are getting persecuted for the actions of people 200 years ago? Well, I just say to them, look, you know, we're only here for a short time. The one thing we all have in common is our, our humanity. And with that should come universal human rights. You are not responsible for things you can't control. I mean, in general, in life, you know. With St. Francis of Assisi or Alcoholicus Anonymous, give me the courage to change the things I can, <laughs> wisdom to, and, uh, the, the, the serenity to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm. If, if you can control things that happened in 1860, then you could be very helpful to New Zealand right now. You could solve a lot of problems. But for everyone that can't change what happened in 1860, let's just focus on where we want to be in 2060 because that's something we can control. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Now, I'm obviously conscious of your time, so I'll just I've got a couple more questions and then we'll wrap this bad boy up. But what are um, one thing I do, you know, have a lot of respect for you, which I find, you know, really funny is, and like interesting. So even when I was growing up, I used to get, you know, dad's team would sit me down and they'd be like, this is how you need to present yourself and can't say X, Y, Z. And I always broke it. And that was why I was constantly getting into shit. But what is funny with you is, you know, you're so happy to do just whatever, like whether it's like twerking on Dancing with the Stars or 
you know, saying funny stuff or doing outrageous shit. What kind of... Because it, it's so funny, like, people go, oh, what's he like? And you're, like, a very straight, serious dude, but then you have this, like, very fun side. What? Where do you think that comes from? I just think it's fun to troll every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, look, there's... There's things that are important to you, right? And there's time to work and there's time to play. So, you know, I really do think New Zealand's at a bit of a, at one of the crunch points that it goes through. About every 50 years, this country has to fish or cut bait, and we're at one of those points. Um, you know, I'd love to go back to 2016 when your dad was in charge. You know, the, the big issue was should the flag be replaced with a tea towel? You know, there was a serious debate back then. And uh, will will Wellington Zoo get pandas or not? I mean, we had, those were happier, simpler times. But now it's, you know, what does the treaty mean? What are we doing about inflation and productivity and school attendance and crime? I mean, these are, this is a much more serious time. And we do need to really be focused on that. So but, no, no well, more twerking? No, 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 no. There's still time to do this. You can still fit twerking in, you know. I mean, I probably won't do that again, but um, but, but there's also time just to let your hair down and have fun, and why not? Because the, um, the listeners have requested a live twerk. No. <laughs> I actually did a live twerk for you, but you could cut it in with the, the, you could you could find the live twerk. We would do that 2019. I was, yeah, oh, yeah. I can't oh, believe yeah. I did that. You asked me so many times. I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, <laughs> no. It's, um, one other question I do have. Do you have a girlfriend? Oh, I'm married to Parliament, mate. So um, it'd be nice. But what I've discovered is that you, you know, in this business, um, there's winning and dying, and there's there's losing and surviving. There's no middle ground, mm. um, and it occupies a huge amount of your headspace. So um, you know, I I certainly don't have a um, partner that I, that I'd be you know, sort of publicly associated with. Um, but you never know. There's, there's always, um, there's, there's sometimes somebody who sympathises with a poor politician. Yeah. So. Do you ever get lonely or? No. Um, do I ever get sleep? Is a better question. <laughs> uh, I mean, you always got stuff to do, um, and so, and I think I just like being at that tempo. Like I, I, I over the summer, I thought, right, I should do this resting thing. I'll just take a few weeks off and see what happens. And I was so boring. Yeah. Um, so no, I I like my life. Um, I like being busy. Um, so it's it's a good space to be. Sweet. Well, you've obviously you know, going up in the polls. So you're obviously impressing some people. So congratulate yeah, that on that. And um, yeah, good luck for the end of the year. And hopefully you know things go the way they want. Yeah. You want them to. And um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for coming on, CMB. No worries, mate. Nice to talk to you. You've officially Thanks. been keyed up. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week.